Okay. Yeah, is that okay? Is that working? Is it working? Yeah, good, okay. Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you for packing in. We've got a room that's not quite big enough. Uh, we're gonna have to see how that goes. So uh, I will make adjustments as necessary. Uh, and I encourage everybody to come to class. So uh, don't let this dissuade you. And I'll do some hardware demos to try to keep you coming, okay? Uh, so yeah, welcome to robotic manipulation. Uh, I had to call it robotic manipulation because I just thought manipulation, you know, uh, in general, without context, could be anything. Uh, but we're gonna, I'm gonna just talk about manipulation uh, today and throughout the semester. I hope that by the end of the lecture, you'll understand uh, a bit more about what, manipulate, what I mean by manipulation and what are the exciting challenges that it brings. Uh, in particular, I mean, you, are, you guys are coming into the field at exactly the right time. My gosh, if, if robots are not just on this incredible rate of progress right now, the things that we can do today that we couldn't do last year, it's kind of a fun time to write course notes because you know the course notes I worked hard on a year ago are obsolete in great ways uh, now. So you'll be you'll watch the course notes evolve during the semester. Okay, so let me let me dive in. Uh, let me just start with a little bit of the the course info. First of all, I'll introduce the people. I didn't mean for that to be me to pop up, but Tommy's here uh, working the the video camera. We are going to try to record the lectures. There's actually a brand new uh, video capture system in the back of the room that hopefully will do it automatically and hopefully will be beautiful and good. But just in case, we're doing it manually this time too. Uh, I can't guarantee that every lecture will be perfect online. We've had times where the audio was gone or the blackboard was too fuzzy or something like this. So coming to class is great, but we do try to put it online, okay? Um, <clears throat> sorry, so the, Tommy's working, work, working the camera here. Uh, Michael's right here. We have uh, also Quincy, is Quincy here? Maybe Quincy's not here yet. Okay, Ethan, I saw, definitely, Ethan's here. Sadana, right there. Uh, broken image, sorry for that, Pranav. Is Pranav here? He's got another class, okay, yeah. And then we also have uh, two communication instructors, so I'll, tell you, I'll say a few more words about that, but Elena's over here. Awesome, it's I think an extremely strong course staff, and I hope you'll work with us closely over the semester. Uh, let me say a few words about the, the communications part. I feel I get a lot of questions just as the semester starts about this, and I just want to say it as clearly as possible right now. So you can take the class as an undergraduate. You can take the class, the graduate version of the class, the 4212, okay? If you're in the undergraduate, that comes with a CIM component, the communications intensive, right? Uh, so that's a 15-unit course. That adds recitations on Friday, right? If you're a grad student, you don't take the recitations. The requirements are hopefully very clear on the website, the differences. The grad students will have a few um, extra problems on the problem sets and different requirements for, for the project. Both groups will do projects. The technical expectations for the graduate students or the four, you can be an undergrad who takes the grad class, but if you take 4212, the expectation on the technical part of the presentation goes up a bit, okay? But you lose the CIM. Now the CIM, some of you need it for graduation, some of you don't, uh, but I actually think it's awesome, whether you need it or, or don't need it. I have to say the projects are a big part of the class, and at the end of the semester, some of the best projects uh, that have come out have been the ones that have had been nurtured through the CIM process to be like super projects, okay? So I really think it's, it's excellent. There'll be journal clubs where you're review, reviewing manipulation relevant papers to begin with, and then it'll work into helping you through your, the project, in, you know, turning your project from a project to a super project, okay? But yeah, just so you, those are your options, right? And there's the project-related CI assignments are hopefully clear on the website, and you can see the, the relevant project-related for the 4212. Put them side by side, make your decision. Again, the recitations are only if you're in the CIM. Okay, just quick logistics. Uh, so we're gonna mostly use Piazza for the, um, for the robotics portion of the, of the semester, so please make sure you're on Piazza. You sh your MIT credentials should get you in. If you have any trouble, let us know. The CIM component only will try to push uh, material to you through Canvas, okay? So if you're an undergrad, or if you're, I should just say, if you're taking 
1.0, you should sign up for Canvas or log into Canvas. Everybody has credentials, but you don't need it if you're in 4.2.1.2. The course guidelines are up on the website. You know, the percentage distribution, the late policy, all these things are hopefully very clear on the website. I'm not gonna give you a piece of paper handout. Uh, so please review them and just make sure you're happy with them. If you have any questions, ask. Uh, the lecture notes are on the website too. And they're meant to be uh, interactive, and they're meant to be even a place where you can ask questions directly. You can highlight something in the lecture notes, say, what the heck did you mean by this? And I will answer, okay? It's a good way to ask questions. Um, <clears throat> okay, we have roughly weekly problem sets. They will taper off as the project tapers up, you know, ramps up. So uh, they're due on Wednesday. The first problem set will be released maybe today, but certainly by tomorrow, on the, it's on the course calendar. And the final project is a big part of the course. You're gonna be able to build some pretty awesome systems by the end. Most of them will be in simulation. Some of you might have some hardware you wanna try. We have some hardware that if you convince me in simulation that it's ready for hardware, then we can try to help you with that. Okay, so yeah, so all of the course website, all the details of assignments and, and late terms, uh, late, uh, late policies and everything are all on the website. And this is what the course notes look like. So you can see like people ask questions. I have a question about which rendering engine is used, right? And I answer. And actually sometimes people from all over the world ask questions and I, I do, do my best to answer. Do you use OpenRave? Uh, do, we, do we use OpenRave? No, 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 don't use OpenRave. You talk about for this? Uh, yeah. No, this is actually, it's called a hypothesis. It's a little uh, HTML JavaScript plugin. Okay, uh, yeah, you'll also find both in the lectures and in the notes, things that you can interact with. The network seems to be a little slow here. It's, that's what it says when it's loading too, just so you know. But we'll see how, there we go. Okay, so you'll see we have this web-based visualizer that's pretty awesome. Uh, you can interact with it. If you're watching the slides and you've pulled up the slides, you can interact with it right now. This is just a, a saved render, but this is also what you get when you're doing work in the class. And um, yeah, it's very, interactive so this is our spot from boston dynamics simulation uh just saved a, a little recording of it you know getting up and looking around a little bit right you could sort of understand what's happening here so those green lines it looks like lasers shooting out of the feet or something like that what are those contact forces contact forces so i can actually turn those on and off the contact forces Get that makes it a little cleaner. It's actually kind of cool too. You can, um, if you want to see what the inertial properties of the robot are, you can visualize its inertial ellipses, right? If you want to see, a lot of times the collision geometry that the physics engine uses is different than the original geometry. So you can see what the collision geometries of spot looks like. Those are the things that are going to cause contact forces between the robot and the world. Okay, but this is like an interactive part, and it's it should work on every computer. It's just a browser-based thing, so no installation. Everything should just work. Please use the notes, interact with the notes, give me feedback on the notes. Okay, we did the logistics. Uh, so the, the main goal for today is to tell you a little bit about what I mean by manipulation, which might not be what some other professors mean about, you know, who do robotics mean by manipulation. I'll tell you my slant on it and my biases for it, give you some examples. I come from a bit more of a controls background, okay? So I have a goal in this class to bring some of the rigorous thinking of control theory into the um, sort of wild west of, of robotic manipulation, okay? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit how, why I think that's important, the systems theory perspective, because that helps me tell you a little bit about the spectrum of things we're gonna cover in the class, okay? And then, uh, yeah, we'll just talk about some of the pieces, the core components that you'll have in most modern manipulation systems and to finish up with some of the broader goals for the class. Okay, so what is manipulation? So one of the, um, the important figures, sorry to walk on you there, sir. Uh, one of the important figures in, in manipulation research was Matt, is Matt Mason from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he's got a, a beautiful review of robotic manipulation. It's, it's a great thing to read if you're interested. He was very thoughtful in thinking about all the different ways you might define manipulation, okay? So his first definition was, um, Manipulation just means activities performed by the hands. That can be tool use, that can be you know, specifically picking up objects, it can, be, it can be potentially very rich, okay? And he goes through a series of different possible definitions, 
but maybe the most operative one for the class here, which is definition five, by the way, right, um, is that manipulation refers to the agent's control of the environment through selective contact. So that's kind of a nice way to think about it, right? My goal is to affect a change in the environment. I've got, you know, people, objects, whatever in the world. I want to apply forces in order to affect change, and that task is manipulation. Okay, so that's almost what I mean by manipulation. All right, so that, the only thing I don't like about that is that kind of gives you this view of like there's a robot and there's an object. This, in this case, it's holding a little red foam brick, okay? And I just want to change the position of the brick. And that is good. That is, that is correct. That, that is under the umbrella of manipulation. But it means way more than that when I think about manipulation. Okay, so this is manipulation. And this is way more than most robots can do with manipulation, right? This is, this is what we teach our kids, right, to tie their shoelaces. But if you think about applying selective contact to the world in order to accomplish this change in state in the environment, that's tough. That's super rich dynamics and control playing out right there, okay? And we want to embrace that. We want to sort of dig into some of the details of how, do you, how would you build a manipulation system towards that. I can't actually offer a solution to that yet. Maybe next year. Okay. But even more so, so that's kind of digging into how rich maybe the dynamics and control could be. But even more so is that um, we want to talk about open world manipulation and with autonomy. So I, I don't want someone using a joystick to, make, to accomplish manipulation. I want the robot to be making its own decisions and understanding the world. Okay. So Matt's definition says, refers to an agent's control of the environment through selective contact. All true, but it's broader when you're in an open world. Open world is a term from video games, right? That's basically like you don't know what the objects are going to be in the world. You will keep walking. You keep getting more objects spawned in front of you. Or you just walk into the next room and there's some objects you've never seen before. How do you m make a manipulation system that's capable about reasoning about anything that could be in somebody's home or somebody's factory or whatever? Okay? And that requires a lot more than just dynamics and control, the way we think of it. That requires a very rich perceptual understanding of the environment. You know, some sort of common sense understanding of what objects are. If I've seen an object, if I, there's an object I've never seen before, but it's similar enough to things I've seen, I have a lot of intu intuition about how it's going to act when I start applying forces, right? How do you bring that into the robotic system, right? And then the ability to make long-term task-level plans, right? And combine them all the way down to sort of fine joint-level motions. So if I need to make a bowl of cereal for my kid, right? I need to go to the, the closet and pull out the cereal box. I need to go to the fridge, move the pickles out of the way to get to the milk. You know, I mean, this is like a complicated sequence of actions that are uh, trying to achieve this physical goal of moving things around in the environment, right? So you can get all the way to in full intelligence just thinking about manipulation. And maybe it's the best way to think about intelligence, but that's my bias, okay? So let me give you a couple examples now, uh, I think just of systems that maybe capture that. Often these are gonna come from, from to the Toyota Research Institute. Just, I have a, a second job over there and the, the folks at TRI can build robot systems at a level of maturity, you know, putting together all these components in ways that it's hard to do in academia. So when I try to show a full stack robot doing all the things, I'll often turn to some of the, the videos that are coming out of TRI. So here's an example of uh, of a robot that's just tasked with loading the dishwasher, okay? So it goes something like this, right? So C1 here is, uh, dumps random junk into the sink, right? There's also, also plates and mugs and spoons. And the robot's job is to do the, whole, to do the dishes, right, roughly. So it's gotta open the dishwasher, it's gotta put the mugs in the top shelf, the plates in the bottom shelf, the silverware in the silverware rack, anything that's not a dish, it has to understand it was not a dish and throw it in the refuse pile over on the side, okay? If you think about all of the pieces that have to go into making something like that work, that's, I think, a s closer to what I mean by this sort of the problem of manipulation. There's a lot going on there, right? Even at the low level, I'll show you some of the, some of the you know, slightly nuanced things that are happening there, but this thing, this system used to run all day, and all day, all night, and just, you know, do its best to load the dishes until someone dumped some more dishes in and then just keep going got to a very high level of maturity. 
Okay, so just like zoom in on a few of the things that are happening that are actually super interesting. So, <clears throat> uh, first of all, you had to open the dishwasher door. That's non-trivial. If you, if you get that wrong, you could jam your robot, okay? Uh, Picking up silverware sometimes requires like nudging it out of the corner because your big robot hand doesn't fit in the corner of the sink, right? Picking up plates is one of my favorite. You have to sort of get your fingers in just right and understand what's a plate and not a plate and subtle ways. Here's like the zoom in on the, um, the plates. This is a simulation, of course, on the, the left and the real robot on the right. It's been a lot of work on trying to make simulations match reality. That's partly what makes teaching a class like this really possible to scale, you know, and, and have a lo uh, lots of you interact with lots of pretty complicated manipulation systems. Yeah, please. How specifically is this implemented on, like, a general class of dishes, or have you implemented it for those specific dishes that you use for the... Yeah, yeah, that's great. So it depends on which version of the system you at, the, you've seen. Yeah, so the, the first versions we did were actually we would train perception systems that worked for certain plates, certain mugs, certain spoons, and then we started randomizing those and covering a big swath. But you could probably go to the Disney store in the mall and come home with a mug that I couldn't pick up with that perception system, right? So there's limits to how much diversity we could handle in that. And the deep learning revolution has brought us new capabilities in that space, but still generalization is an open challenge. So that's always a great question to ask is sort of how how general is this? Does this work for exactly one type of plate or every plate? And it's always the answer is always something in between. This is um, this is a simulation, right, of a of the hand of a more dexterous hand picking up those plates. And by the way, simulation like this didn't really work a few years ago. It's only very recently that computer game engine quality rendering has gotten good enough to to train state of the art perception systems and some of the physics engines have gotten good enough that you can actually do research in simulation that you expect to have work on the real robot. Okay, so, and then, you know, the Boston Dynamics guys, they kick the robot. It's hard to kick a dishwasher, but, uh, you know, that's kind of what we were going for there, right? So, so even if the, someone sets, you know, closes the dishwasher rack, then the robot was working on a mug, it's like, all right, I'll put the mug down and I'll open the dishwasher rack again. And you can almost sense the robot being annoyed uh, you know, but it'll go pick it up, and but it'll it'll get the job done most of the time, okay? So really, this quest of understanding manipulation goes from low-level control uh, all the way up to sort of scene-level understanding, task-level planning. There's really a broad level of intelligence, if you will. You can go from the hindbrain to the you know, cortex or whatever. So, uh, and and we'll explore. The swath, the, the, you know, the different rungs of the ladder, maybe that analogy is going a little too far, uh, throughout the semester. And for your project, you'll pick some level and try to dive in a bit deeper and, and focus in on those. The world gets even more open. So, so one of my reflections on teaching the class last year was that people did awesome projects, but they were all a robot bolted to a table and you know, a hand doing certain objects because that's all I had given people to, to work with, okay? So um, and that, that limits your thinking, I think, a little bit because you know, the world gets even more open if you can dr walk into the next room and see a brand new objects. So, so one of my goals for the, for the term is to bring more mobile manipulation into the, into the discussion and to, into your projects, okay? So this is an example, again, a, a full system from, from TRI, the Toyota Research Institute, and uh, it's actually, they have a partnership with a local grocery store, and at night, they just take hundreds of items, make a random shopping list, and go get the groceries, right? And they're, uh, they drop groceries every once in a while, they log their failures, and they just get better and better and better as they work on this more and more and more, getting to like a real, solving real systems level tasks with a robot, okay? but. Going into an arbitrary grocery store and dealing with the, the diversity of that inventory, you know, that's bigger than the kitchen sink, right? And, uh, and you could have a new stocked item that just you've never seen before. And if you go out of the grocery store, it might be even more complicated still. So, uh, yeah, again, Spot is, is, uh, is a robot from Boston Dynamics. It's got an arm on top of it often. And, uh, and like I said, one of our goals this year is to do more mobile manipulation. And so just for, for grins, 
I brought Spot. It's hiding back here behind the door. We'll do a little mobile manipulation challenge real quick before the batteries run out, yeah? Just gotta wait for the motors to power on real quick, but. This is Spot. I'll do my best to do live demos in the class. It's a lot of work and I'm far away from my building, but uh, this one can walk over, so that was pretty good. All right, I brought one of Spot's toys here just to show a very basic demo, but dog, robot dogs love robot plush toys, so why not? We'll just walk up and ask him to pick up. Now, yeah, depending on how I do this, uh, it may or may not show a failure mode, but let's see. All right, success, huh? Let's go back and carry it back. All right, good job, Spot, yeah. Now, because I want Spot to walk back home, I'm gonna power it down now, okay? <laughs> Otherwise the batteries are gonna die on me. Uh, it's, you can carry it if you want to, but I'm recruiting you if, uh, I don't know exactly the weight, I'm 70 pounds, something like that. It's a lot of battery weight. It's also loud, so I have to fully power it down. Cool. Maybe I should have put it somewhere less in front of my board. But. <laughs> Over here, Spot. All right. Okay. So um, some of you have taken underactuated with me. It's the other class I teach. It's a graduate class. If you haven't, maybe you'll take it next. Um, or some of you might just know that I've done sort of this controls background. So uh, let me tell you sort of how I came into manipulation and a little bit what's the dynamics and controls perspective. I already showed you the shoelaces. That's like awesome dynamics and control. But there's some really important things that happen which make manipulation a challenge, a, like the thing I want to focus my work on controls on, okay? So I've done work on humanoid robots, on walking robots. This is a the early version of the Atlas robot from Boston, from Boston Dynamics. You've seen the new version doing parkour uh, in an awesome fashion, and that's a real thing that really works beautifully well. Uh, <clears throat> this was a DARPA Robotics Challenge a handful of years ago where we had to program the whole stack to make it cross stairs, open doors, turn valves, and things like this. That was really the first time that we had to do some amount, that I really started thinking about some amount of manipulation. And it was a relatively closed world. We had to turn various valves, but they were all in a small family of valves, and we would make a valve detector. This was actually right as the deep learning thing was happening, right? So we weren't, most people were not using, I think nobody was really using deep learning that year. Next year, everybody was using deep learning, but uh, okay, so, and, and the way you would program a control system like that is, is, is awesome, right? I mean, you can make these balancing controllers that are super robust, even if people are jumping on the vehicle while you're trying to get out with one foot, you know, and that stuff works really well. Okay, and it's built on this premise of you kind of go through the world and you understand the world in a sort of geometry sense for walking, right? You have to sort of understand where you're allowed to step, uh, you know, what, what you shouldn't run into, okay? But that's, you can do a lot in locomotion with a relatively limited understanding of the world, right? You don't have to understand, I mean, if you're walking on uh, some obstacle course, then it's more, but if, but if you just gotta understand, yeah, I'm allowed to step there or I'm not allowed to step there, that's a relatively limited amount of understanding you have to do for the world. When you look in the kitchen sink, the natural extension of that is to try to say, I'm gonna write a mug detector, 
right? I'm going to figure out where the mugs are, what's the pose of the mugs. These are um, those highlights are key points of uh, you know a, a, an output from our pose detector of the mug, okay? And then you can start building a control system that's trying to do work a lot like Atlas when he's balancing on the car, but now you're trying to, to regulate the positions of the mugs, okay? And it's hard, but, but you can grow in that direction. But then you start saying, okay, well, like, what are all the mugs in the world that I haven't seen before? And you, how do you write a control system that sort of accomplishes work on all the mugs in the world? And that starts to challenge my views of control from a few years ago, right? So the, the, the standard thing of, of modeling the world, having a perfect physics model, building a control system to stabilize that model, doesn't really map directly to like any mug, okay? So we had to start changing the way we thought about uh, state, about representation. I'll make those all more precise as we go, right? Because the control problem and manipulation, the control problem for Atlas doing parkour is really about Atlas, right? The robot needs to understand its dynamics very well, and you can sort of master your dynamics and do incredible things. But the control problem for manipulation is not just controlling the robot, it's also controlling the objects in the world and that means you have to understand potentially everything, <laughs> okay? And it's weird that tying shoelaces or even picking up objects in some ways is, is harder than doing backflips, but in, in, they just did, they exercise different parts of your brain and of the robot's brain, I guess, okay? So the state of the robot is part of the problem, but the stabilizing the state of the environment, however you choose to represent that is another part of the problem. And when you get to interesting manipulation tasks, you think like, how am I going to represent that? Or like, you know, if I read a piece of onion detector and then I like the, the number of onions is changing every time and this sort of like just takes my classical understanding, not even that classical, my modern understanding of control and, and challenges it in fundamental ways. I don't know how to like build world models of that that are trying to estimate the shape and the pose of all the pieces that would scale to a simple problem, even though that should be not that hard of a problem. Okay, so that's how I came to be super excited about manipulation is that I think it breaks some, I mean, we, we can do amazing things with control. We can do backflips, we can do these things, but we can't, we can't do that. Why can't we do that? Humans do make it look easy. It should be easy, okay? So that's, that's my primary interest. Now, the world is making super fast progress in that dimension, okay? And one of the ways the people are doing it is by using deep learning, but most essentially, right, they have, We'll have potentially big perception networks, so you can go directly from a, an, an image to make your decisions. But I think the most essential thing is that this, they have intermediate layers that are learning implicit state representations of the world. Okay, so instead of having a mug detector or having an onion piece detector, the intermediate layers of the neural network are able to learn some more fundamental representation that does scale and maybe doesn't have to track every piece of the onion if it's not task relevant, okay? And these notions of sort of new learned state representations I think are fundamentally important in how we have to think about the control problem, okay? Now, we'll talk a lot about visual motor policies, that's the buzzword for it, okay? And we'll talk about the different approaches to it when we get there. Uh, but that really does make a difference. And so we started to see control systems that could really go directly from RGB images solve dynamics and control problems that were non-trivial, you know, flexible hats hanging on a rack, you know, these are visually cluttered scenes, any shoe, right? And solving them with the, some of the robustness we associate with uh, humanoid balancing, for instance, but doing it in this open, more open world setting. So that's where the world, that's where the research world is just exploding right now. Is, and of course, large language models are coming into to add that whole component to, okay? And so I think this is gonna change the way we think about control for everything, and that's why I'm passionate about pursuing it. Just another, a zoom in of that example, right? Just to do a non-trivial, but sort of starts in the land of, we can understand what a plate is, we can understand the dynamics of a plate, we can pick a, write a control system that sort of thinks about the plate, but when you start saying, 
that the primary sensor is a camera and you start saying we need to deal with all the visual diversity and all the different plates and, and all these things, then it gets really rich and, and that's where deep learning has opened things up for us. It doesn't mean, though, that you have to throw away fundamental basic understanding. And I will still advocate for making darn sure when you build your big complicated systems that you understand how it works in a simple model that you know, is based on just physics and, it, and removes that complexity. If you don't understand how the big complicated thing boils down and works in the simple cases, then I don't think you fully understand what's happening. So that's just a, you know, a simplified version of that same task. Having said that, we can now do things that would have defeated state representations that we had before. So like, how do you, how do you design a dough detector, right? Or you know, how do you roll the pizza dough? But these tasks are relatively easy for some of the deep learning approaches, okay? And we're, we're trying to figure out how to put all this together and to make really complicated systems. It's actually surprisingly robust. You can like mess with the dough, right? It'll just, it'll get it done. Just keep rolling until it's happy. You can, mess, you can perturb the dough, it'll keep going. You can spread sauce. Uh, that's another one. I was, we, we had a kind of a list of things that I didn't know how to do, right? Of like, what's the state of the sauce? I don't know what the state of the sauce is, but we can now, you know, even though the task looks simple, it should be simple, from a controls perspective, this would have been extremely hard. And the fact that we're starting to be able to do this is, is just awesome. That's kind of a high level motivation. Any questions about that? I want the class to be interactive. I know it's big, but that, which is great, but feel free to ask questions. Yeah. Um, for like those examples that you showed, um, and you were talking about how you represented state of your system. Yeah. Uh, do the deep cleaning methods still, as you mentioned before, like, are they still figuring out some way to represent the state, or are they just looking at something else entirely? How does it know like, the process and what properties and what it's done? Yeah, yeah, that's great. So it's a big question. So, so how exactly are the deep networks figuring out the state representation? And oftentimes, I mean, maybe a, a version of that question is, is there even an explicit notion of state? Is there like a point in the network where you point and say, that's the state? And I'd say in some approaches, yes, there, they, there's an explicit like pre-trained something that tries to come out with an explicit latent vector that I would say that's the state. In other cases, you train the system end to end where the output is early motor actions or, or long-term actions. And then the notion of state is only implicit somewhere in the layers of the network and you don't typically even go and find it, right? So, so that's a, a, a choice that you can make. How do you represent the state of a network? Like for objects, it's much simpler for processes and so on. How, how do you do that? More or less? I don't do it. I, the neural network does it. So the question was, uh, oh, it's yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, the question is, is how would you do a liquid? What's the state of a liquid, right? I mean, the fluid dynamicists have an answer. They would, you could do Eulerian, you could do Lagrangian, you can track particles, you can track whatever, and that's not practical for what we want to, if you just want to pour spread sauce, right? Um, so in that particular example, there were a lot of demonstrations of humans teleoperating the robot to, to spread the sauce. And we said, we want, when you see this picture, you want to take similar actions and Somewhere in the middle, it's deciding a representation for sauce, right? And I think we, if we want to generalize that, that might, maybe that can go the distance, or maybe we have to go in and understand that representation and apply it in a more general way. Yes? I don't know if I might be getting a little bit ahead of myself, but um, with a lot of these things, like for example, like how like fluids work, um, there's a lot of like physics rules that get applied to that. Does that usually get like incorporated inside of like the learning system when we're doing sort of deep learning approach? That's a super good question. So the question is, would you, I'll just repeat it for the, the folks watching. Uh, yeah, so, so the question is, if we know a lot of things about the, what liquids can do from physics, do we incorporate those in the neural representations or the, is the neural network just ignoring that? And I think the simplest answer is we're almost always ignoring it. But there's a l very active field of research of trying to do physics-inspired neural networks and trying to, do, trying to bring in um, biases from hopefully, you know, some of our knowledge about mechanics, for instance, or in other fields where you have some other knowledge into the neural network. Now, the, the trade-off there, you know, Rich Sutton would say, anytime you inject your understanding of the world, then you've corrupted the system and you've limited what it's capable of learning. 
Okay, but you probably also made it more data efficient. So there's a trade-off there, right? Awesome, great question. Okay, so I wanna start sort of digging in, unpacking what, the, what are the different pieces of, the, of a manipulation system and how we're gonna think about them in this class because I think about things through the lens of control, okay? Even perception is just a control problem, okay? Uh, so how many people know Ross? You don't have to know Ross. Don't feel bad if you're not putting your arms up. I'm just trying to understand. I don't assume people know robotics, but if you've done robotics, and you've, then you've probably touched Ross, the robot operating system. You, you pick, you, you can pick your threshold of whether you, how, your knowledge of Ross. But if you've been exposed to Ross, then you can, uh, you have a sense for what the anatomy of a manipulation system could look like, right? So what is Ross? Ross is, well, I think it's one of the best things that happened to robotics. It's called, an, they call it an operating system. That's kind of a misnomer, right? It's really, uh, well, it's, it's a way of packaging different components of a manipulation system that run on a proper operating system and they pass messages back and forth. Okay, and it allowed us to sort of break up the, the manipulation problem into a more modular approach. Okay, so you might write a ROS node that could be my camera driver, for instance, right? So I buy a, a, a camera from Intel, let's say. It, has some low-level uh, you know, software that, that talks to it and somewhere gives you an image, okay? So I could make a little ROS node, in fact, people have done this for me now, make a little ROS node, which a ROS node is an executable, something, you know, a process that you'd run It could be a Python script or whatever, but it's somehow something that runs as a process on your computer, okay, and starts sending messages that have the information you need from that driver for the rest of the, the world to, to think about. So maybe from the driver, it's just gonna spit out RGB images. In robotics, we often actually use depth cameras, so they have red, green, blue, but also depth coming out. And it just says, I'm gonna send packets on a network protocol uh, that contain these images. And I'll define exactly the spec in a general way. Okay, and then you write a different process, a different ROS node that might be my perception system. And the perception system is a different executable. You run it, it's, it's kind of a pain. When you're working with ROS, you have to start lots of processes every time you wanna run the robot. Okay, but that's how we go. And uh, Right, so maybe I'll start a different process that starts listening for RGB images and puts out, for instance, you know, the, what's the, let's say, what's the position or the pose of the mug? Like I said, that's probably not gonna take us the whole way, but that's a simple example for now. Okay, and maybe the pose of the mug goes to some other planning system. that listens for the state of the mug and maybe also the state of the robot, for instance. And tries to decide how does my robot need to move through the world in order to manipulate the mug, okay? And it'll kick out some joint trajectories, for instance. This is just one version of that. The deep learning version could look different, for instance. Okay, and then Maybe I've got my robot controller here that thinks about commands of where the robot wants the hands to be or the arms to be and turns that into motor commands. And then there's some other motor driver that uh, you know shipped from the company that you bought the motors from. Okay, <clears throat> and what's important, the reason I wanted to just take a second to write that down is that ROS really did an amazing thing. It helped us start to modularize and compartmentalize some of the complexity of building a big system like this. Okay, so, um, and in particular, it made it easier to share. Uh, it was a, it's an open source project, uh, one of the great open source projects in robotics, okay. 
and it started an entire ecosystem of people who could say, um, well, maybe I'll download a perception system from Carnegie Mellon, you know, and then I'll like get my robot controller from the German Space Agency. They're really good at that, you know, and then, and then I just want to write a planning system, okay, so I'll, I'll focus my attention on writing a really good planning system, and then if I, if I succeed and write a really good one, I'll put it up in Ross and everybody else can download it and work on their perception systems or whatever, right? And this sharing that happened because of Ross was just fantastically good. But also the modularity that happened with that was important and special, right? So uh, the fact that these are running as different executables and the only connection was this message type was sort of fundamental. Like you could, as long as I could compile your code, I didn't have to, I didn't, if you, you could have been using C++, I was using Java, you were whatever, somehow the ecosystem became much more friendly. In fact, if you wrote yours in Windows and I wrote mine in Linux, um, Linux is better, you should write it, but, but, uh, <laughs> but even if you wrote it in Windows, you should, you could, I could run a Docker image and just run my ROS process in, in, in Windows, you know, and then, and I can put that all together and bundle it up and, or maybe, let me say, you wrote yours in Ubuntu 14, a long time ago, right? And I wrote mine in 22, okay? And they, you know, I don't wanna run Ubuntu 14 anymore, but I still wanna run your perception system, so I'll just put a Docker container around it. Okay, so a little side note. I, I have an interesting challenge of talking to people that are at many levels of the spectrum here. Some of you are robotics experts, some of you are never doing robotics yet, but this is great to start. So I'll drop in some, some lingo somehow that uh, maybe not everybody understands. I, I do that somewhat intentionally. I apologize if I do it too much. Uh, I hope that the folks that are experts get a little bit out of it, but I hope that it doesn't, I will try to be conscious to never drop language that you must know to understand the next concept. Okay, so if I say, if you don't, if you don't know what versions of Ubuntu are, that's fine. That's fine. That was not, that was just a, a fun thing to drop. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good, so this is, this is extremely a uh, powerful way to think about the complex the complexity of building a big modern manipulation system. And really, this is the a canonical standard. We're gonna build a separate perception system because there's some research groups that are really good at perception, a separate planning system, a separate robot control. It's not clear that that's the right architecture and it's easy to point to examples where that distinction is, is, is a limitation, okay? And we'll, we'll challenge that later. But that's as a starting sketch. This is sort of the sense, plan, act. Uh, paradigm in artificial intelligence, and we don't love it, but, but it's, it's been useful. <clears throat> okay, so let me just contrast that with, uh, let's say, it, this, is, this is the raw software engineering view of the world, right? So as long as you write a program that when I run, it starts listening to messages, it could be doing anything it wanted internally. It could be calling random number generators, it could be like, you know, mining Bitcoin, as long as it's spitting out the pose of the mug at 10 hertz, I'm good. I don't have to know anything about what's inside. Okay, let's contrast this with uh, like the control view of the world, which makes similar diagrams, okay, but asks a little bit more about, I wanna know what's inside your, your diagrams, okay? So a standard um, approach in control, control theory is, if you've ever used uh, Simulink or Modelica or a handful of these tools, LabVIEW even is a bit like this, right? They, there's something called model-based design. Which says if you've got a big complicated system and you wanna think about it rigorously, then you should start by encapsulating that complexity in a block diagram, right? So maybe I have my, my actual robot here and it's a thing that takes in motor commands and puts out sensor information. Maybe it's a simulator, maybe it's the robot, okay? But I have some sort of, you know, model of this. Now, Ross really pushed the notion, uh, sensor, Ross pushed the notion that these communication channels should be network pass it, message passing, okay? But before these, these were signals and systems, right? In block diagrams, in controls, okay? And you could compose these signals and systems into more complicated block diagrams. And I think they're, they're two sides of the same story, okay? And let's just compare and contrast them, 
right? So if I'm in Simulink or something like this, then in order to describe my robot, I'm going to use the language of differential equations typically, or difference equations, in order to describe what's happening inside this box. They could be really complicated difference equations, but they're probably not mining, mining Bitcoin, you know? Uh, they could, I guess they could. But, uh, right, so inside here, I'll, I'll say it's not an arbitrary executable. It's not anything I could write in software. It's going to be some sort of like difference equation. Okay, so here, x in this example would be the state of the robot, for instance. It could be the positions and velocities of the joint. U is typically used in these frameworks as the input, which is in this case the motor commands. All right, so I would have a difference equation that takes the state of the robot, potentially does some complicated physics in this case or perception in some other case. Okay, tells me how the state of the robot evolves on the next step. And then I have some other function that tells me how to generate the sensors from the state and the input. Right, this is the language of difference equations. Okay. And you've seen it maybe in 1803 if you were an MIT undergrad or are an MIT undergrad. Um, <clears throat> okay, you probably saw simpler versions of it. You, could, you might have seen it as this is a state space difference equation. Maybe you saw it first as a linear difference equation with linear algebra involved. Maybe if you took an a intro controls course, you would have seen the state space version that would have included control inputs. Something like that, okay. This is just the nonlinear generalization where f can be an arbitrary function. And what's interesting is that I would claim that almost everything you could write uh, in your ROS, that you would want to write in your ROS ecosystem for controlling a big complicated robot could be described carefully with difference equations, differential equations. And in particular, writing it this way says, for our, when we're combining systems together, we're not only going to agree on the message pass, the message type that's passed, we're going to say something, this embeds a timing semantics pretty firmly, okay? So we have to say something about how often this is getting updated. We have to declare our state, so it's not going to be arbitrary. It's going to, we have, for instance, if I ever wanted to rewind my simulation or my, my controller or whatever and just play it back in time, you can do that if you've declared state, but if you're doing arbitrary computations, you can't do that, okay? And, and these functions can be complicated. That's not really a limitation, but it does ask you to sort of not just agree on the message passing, but agree on somehow that we're gonna use difference and differential equations to describe our systems, okay? In some cases, like the, you know, the, the camera model, if in, in simulation, the thing that takes the state of the world and puts out RGBD images, that's a full-on game renderer, right? That's a, that's a photorealistic renderer that I'm writing in this function G, right? So that's not what you saw in 1803, and it's complicated, and you might not wanna, there might be some questions you wouldn't wanna ask about that big complicated G, okay? But it still fits in the intellectual framework. Okay, and I'm gonna advocate both for research and for the sort of pedagogical value of having things in class that we, every time we build our systems, we do a little bit more work and we use the difference and differential equation view of, the, of those systems, okay? And that's gonna allow better things to happen down, down the stream, downstream. Like I said, you could rewind your simulation, you can have, you can do Monte Carlo testing if you want. You can, there's a lot of things that come just from having taken a little bit more work every time you build each component. I also don't want to help everybody install ROS. That's really not a fun way to teach a class. Okay, so we, we're gonna just give one software thing that, that does sort of this version of it. Okay, but it's modular in the same way that ROS is, okay, but it's, um, it's using the language of difference equations. Yeah, these functions are really do get complicated, and like I said, 
The fact that G you know, is, a, is a renderer that's sort of good enough to train a perception system. Or you know, a neural network can fit in this framework too. So one of these systems might be a neural network, right? They could take, for instance, RGB images in or RGBD images and spits out, let's say, a pose of the mug, but that's not the final story. So let's just think for a second. What if we put a, a big net neural network in here? OK. Is, that, is it useful to think about neural networks? I, mean, I want to think about neural networks with PyTorch or something, right? I don't want to think about it as differential equations. That's not true. I want to think about it as differential equations, and I want to slowly convince you to think about it as differential equations, OK? So, so if you're doing a feed-forward neural network, OK, then you could write that as a, a simple function that has no state and just as a big, you know, this is my neural network function that just takes inputs and outputs, the output of the network, right? If I have a recurrent network, then I do have a state, and I should tell my system about it. And I, that way, if I ever wanted to rewind the progress of my, uh, my uh, LSTM, for instance, or other, your favorite recurrent neural network, okay, then I could declare that state. And I should declare that state if I'm trying to make more rigorous understanding of the complicated system. Okay? If you're a transformer, then maybe you just have really big input tapes, or you call this your, your buffer, you know, uh, that, but it all fits. Transformers fit fine in, into this framework. Okay, so I'll show a few examples of that here, but um, <clears throat> the, the software that we're gonna use, because that's um, what I've been working on a lot, is called Drake, okay? So it's, uh, uh, a lot of people ask me what, what Drake is, right? And um, I think the simplest answer, you, you, how many people know Harry Potter? You know, you know what a horcrux is? I think Drake is kind of my horcrux, probably. That's, the, that's probably the most honest answer I can give you. Is like I'm, it's kind of like me trying to put my soul into a piece of software. And, and I've had a, some incredibly talented engineers that have been helping, have been, have been working on it and making the Dynamics engine really good. But it's kind of, uh, it's a passion for me, okay, about trying to take some of this differential equation, difference equation view of the world and make it solve extremely complicated physics uh, in, controls problems, okay? Uh, and it, I think it's good enough to be used in the class and it's, you know, it'll run in your browser with no installation and all that other stuff, okay? So uh, I won't do, dive too much into it today, but we'll try to work you through. I've gotten feedback over the, uh, over the years that actually a little bit more tutorials about Drake early on would help people with their homeworks and certainly help people with their projects. So we have a few problems that sort of ask you to explore the software a little bit too. Okay, but it's really meant to build up three things. One of them is this modeling dynamical system. So if you want to take this difference equation description and build really good robot models, really good neural network models and this or whatever, then you can do that. And it has a block diagram language that you can say, I'm going to add this system, I'm going to add this system, I'm going to connect it, connect the output port here to the input port here. Okay, and it's going to be a, a it, it, it's not only, uh, you know, a toolbox for writing these, but it's a big collection of the systems that have already been written for you. So a big collection of different controllers and dynamical systems and the like. A lot of those dynamical systems in my world use optimization. So there's actually a really nice optimization library attached in, built into Drake. So you can, if you wanted to write a controller by solving a small a convex optimization problem or whatever, that's very possible in Drake. That's kind of what it was built for too. And then there's a lot of specific tools for if, when you get into the physics engine of how to, working with the dynamics of, of, the, of the system, solving kinematics problems, solving dynamics problems, asking what's the center of mass of this really complicated thing, okay? What is the Jacobian of some strange quantity? It's really good at those kind of things. Okay, and it provides this level of abstraction, right? So the signals and system, there's a lot of tutorials, by the way, online if you ever get stuck. A lot of people, I think, don't go back and look at the tutorials, but you can. Uh, and it's perfectly compatible with ROS. If you want to have your Drake diagrams live in your ROS ecosystem, that, just, that should just work, especially ROS2. Okay, so let me give you an example here of sort of 
you know, Drake's version of this is you model these systems with difference or differential equations. And there's, you can do that for very simple things and you can do it very, for very complicated things. Okay, but if you get to the robot level, then we're gonna see complicated systems here. So we have a particular system that you'll use a bunch. We're calling it the hardware station. Basically every physical robot that you wanna work with should ha sort of have a digital twin, if you will, that's this, it's described in a YAML file and describes not only the physical elements of your robot and the objects it will interact with, but also the drivers that are on that robot, okay? And that gets packaged up and provides encapsulation into a one big system, which for instance, if I have a, a KUKA IWA robot, we'll talk about our specific robots, but there's a particular type of robot called an IWA, I-I-W-A, okay? And a particular type of gripper we'll use a bunch called a Shunk WSG. So if you wanna unpack these, if I take a particular hardware station and it has a IWA in it and a WSG, okay, and the IWA driver is looking for a position command, possibly a torque command, feed forward torque, and the shunk driver is listening for a position command, maybe a force limit. Those are the, those are the commands that the software we get from the manufacturer provide, okay? And the, the Drake abstraction of this will give you input ports that are signals that are waiting for those commands and will send it to either a simulated version of the IWA and the shunk or the real hardware, uh, depending on, you just flip a switch and it'll change, and inside this it'll do the message passing just like in, in ROS, okay? And on the other side, right, the EWA driver spits out a lot of different things. It says what position it got commanded, position measured, all these things, but this abstraction, right, is exactly provided by the drivers and the real robot. That's the boundary layer. And by encapsulating it with the signals and systems of this block diagram, I can change the implementation underneath, but if you've written your control system just expecting to talk here, the same way in ROS, I have a very modular approach, I can, just, I can do things like flip a switch and I've switched from simulation to the real robot. In particular, if you do wanna convince me to run your code on the real robot at the end of the term, there's actually two steps we'll do. First, we'll make it run all in one simulation, okay? And then we'll say, run on a remote robot but I'm not gonna turn on the robot, I'm gonna turn on a simulator on another computer and make sure that it works on a remote simulator with all the message passing and nothing blows up. And then if you're not gonna break the robot, then we'll, we'll turn off that second simulator and turn on the robot and it'll all just work. Okay, so in software engineering, you could sort of say, think of it as you know, uh, object-oriented programming. Classes provide levels, you know, tools for encapsulation and abstraction and when used properly, they can allow you to build incredibly complicated systems. In the dynamical systems world, which we are living in in the class here, uh, it's signals and systems. Systems are what provide that similar level of encapsulation and abstraction. You tell me your inputs and your outputs, what's happening on the inside with differential equations, and we've, we can do similar, build big, tall towers of complicated things, right? If you zoom inside that, then you'll actually see a lot of complexity. So when you're in simulator mode, for instance, that, uh, that hardware station abstraction is actually in itself a diagram, okay? And if you look inside what's happening with the EWA position, okay, it's actually being fed to another system, which is a inverse dynamics controller, for instance, which then goes to a, um, our dynamics engine, which we call multi-body plant. That's the physics engine. And it, uh, it also goes to something we call the scene graph. You'll, you'll explore these things, but this is the rendering engine. Okay, and there's a variety of different systems that are inside here that ultimately puts out my ability to put a camera image, a simulated camera image. Okay, and you can nest these diagrams and build up more and more complicated abstraction. I'll run a quick example here. 
now. So this is uh, your first, the first intro notebook in the class. I hope you run it. I hope you play with it. You see that it'll always open up these um, a browser. This is Meshcat, our, our browser. You don't have to install anything to run this. It'll all, even the notebook will run in the cloud. And you have a relatively simple script that describes, I'm going to add a, a model, which is the EWA, and it's described in this particular format. I'm going to add a, a different model that is the shunk gripper that's described in this place. And it's just a, a series of sort of simple things. I'm going to add a brick to the world, okay, and then I wire it all up, and I get a simulator now that I can interact with and run and pick up the brick. That's in YAML? The YAML is the description uh, for, the, for that, yep, and then it parses into a, a, a system, signals and systems thing, okay? And you sh I hope you all just go home and run that and, and try it. Any questions about that? Yes. Iwa is a strange name, all lowercase. I always want to capitalize it because it's a proper name, but no, nah, uh, the manufacturers call it Iwa, okay? And it's, the, it's exactly that robot that was on the screen here. So KUKA is the manufacturer, and they build lots of robot arms, and one series is called the Iwa, I-I-W-A. Thank you for asking this, by the way, okay? And in particular, there's two that we'll use in class. There's even, there's an Iwa 14 or an Iwa 7, which refers to the payload that they have. And that's something you could buy, you know, for, it's yours for only, you know, $85,000 or something like that. Um, okay, or you can simulate it for free, right? And that, that, the drivers for that provide this abstraction that take position commands in or torque commands in and, and go through it. Our next lecture, we're gonna talk through robot hardware and you'll see how Iwa compares to some of the other robots that are out there. Yes? If we have to see where the um, IRX is focusing, it's going to be Eagle or Frost? Uh, we we're going to put safety filters. He asked if it, he's, he's worried about breaking my robot. Oh, I'm glad you're worried about breaking my robot. We'll, we'll put the proper safety filters when we get there. Did you have a question, sir? Like, rather like breaking the arm. Yeah, we don't want you to break the arm. Yeah. Um, just to understand the hardware station. Yes. That's a really good question. Okay, so the abstraction um, should be exactly what you see uh, if you were to turn on the robot, okay? So the robot drivers output the EWA position and stuff like this, okay? But if you have a camera in there, then they put out an RGB image, okay? So inside here is the physics engine that is loaded with all of the objects. And the cameras, in order to be able to render RGB images, which contain the mug or whatever, it's, it has to be living in the physics engine in here in order to provide the same abstraction, which if I turn the robot on, yeah, it's, it has there. Now, some of these, these orange ports, we call those cheat ports, okay? If you use, if you pull on the body poses, you know, for development purposes, we give you access to the ground truth pose of the mug, okay? But if you switch to hardware mode, that, more, that port is not gonna be available, right? So the simulator, when you're in simulation mode, you can get oracular information about the internal state of the world, which won't be available more generally. Yeah? Yeah, so ROS is an ecosystem which you, where you make the different packages, okay? Drake could be any one of, you could write any one of your systems in Drake, or you can try to write the entire thing in Drake and not use message passing. So ROS is really the communications layer which enabled modular thinking. Drake similarly enables modular thinking because of the whole controls lineage. So one can use ROS without Drake? One can use ROS without Drake. Yeah, but you shouldn't. But, but one can use <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just teasing, yeah. But one cannot use Drake without ROS? That's not true either. So the question is, can you use Drake without ROS? You can, you can run your entire simulation, and we will for most of the class, just to keep the complexity down, all in one process. And then if you want to run on hardware, then, and you've got a, a ROS driver, 
then you put one of the systems that you put inside here. So if, if I run it in hardware mode, okay, if I just flip a switch, then this system, we call it the hardware station interface. Takes the same inputs and outputs, okay, but inside here is like a ROS sender, ROS publisher, and ROS receivers, okay, which handle the network, network messaging, but provide the same input and output abstraction in the signals and systems world, okay, and that's actually even right down here. That's the hardware station interface. It just won't have any of the cheap ports because the drivers can't give you that. Okay, so that is, is that answered? Yeah. Uh, if I'm understanding, um, the hardware station is an interface that lets you interact with the robot or a simulator of the robot. In cases where you want to simulate multiple robots interacting, and so you know you will on one hand at runtime want to be able to send commands to each robot individually, yeah, uh, and have each one possibly reasoning independently. How do you use this interface to also simulate the full environment with all of your robots interacting if the simulators live um, inside the hardware station? Yeah, that's beautiful. So, um, so the question is about multiple robots use cases. If those robots need to interact on the physics level, then you actually make one hardware station that will have EWA 1 position, EWA 2 position, whatever. And then that way they can, the physics engine can have forces interacting and collisions and everything like that. If you don't need them to interact at all, maybe you could say it's cleaner to have two different hardware stations. But as soon as they have to interact, render the same, you know, the camera image from one has to render the other robot when it's looking at it, then they have to live in the same simulator, uh, the same physics engine and same scene graph. Great question. Yes? When I've used ROS in the past, I've used a lot of random third-party libraries for functions like motion time. Yep. When using Drake, do those are those provided by Drake and So, uh, you know, Drake tries to be actually, so, so Drake started as a research project in my group. It grew when Toyota Research started, it became a professional software project. And now it's actually used by lots of companies also. Companies are much more conservative than academics about licenses and everything like this. So we, depend, we use th third party th tools when we can, but we're pretty strict about the licenses. So that does limit us to some extent. If someone GPLs their code, I, I won't use it in Drake, for instance. So, um, so we'd provide most everything you need, sometimes through third-party libraries that you shouldn't have to think about. And the, you know, the course, all the perception planning and control stuff will, will live inside, you know, will be available for you. You might find something that we can't do yet, but we can get through a lot of pretty cool stuff in the class with the provided functionality. PyTorch, for instance, you can make a, a, a thin wrapper around PyTorch, for instance, and we didn't re-implement PyTorch. The gazebo is, is the simulator component in the ROS ecosystem, is the, the most famous one, other things can plug into. Uh, gazebo did a lot of important things, like it helped define uh, different description formats and everything like that, and can import the scene and, and similarly send ROS messages. Drake could be used instead of gazebo. We've, talked, we've been talking to those folks about possibly having Drake be the physics engine inside gazebo. The relationship is, you know, they're, they're solving similar parts of the problem. Uh, but you could just, we don't use Gazebo in the class and we can do all the things that you would want to do. Is the computation for Drake done on your local machine? So if for the class, so you, you can choose to download and install locally. It's, it's actually probably a better experience if you, in terms of like you can use your local IDE, if you're, your, your software development environment. Uh, but for the class, we have it all using DeepNote. So it'll just run on a Python notebook in the, in the sky and you don't have to install anything that way no matter what people have for their computing devices, uh, it, it'll work. And, but it'll typically, you know, a lot of things will run on a single core unless you get fancier and lo run locally and turn on multi-threading and stuff like that. There are limits to what we can do on DeepNote. Awesome questions, thank you guys, okay. Let me think about what I still have time for. Here. Okay, so, I think that was a fair representation of the sort of why 
I'm trying to think about the complexity of manipulation through the signals and systems perspective, okay? And <clears throat> I would say some people, some people think that manipulation is too complex, you shouldn't bother trying to write differential equations to describe it. Like what benefit are you gonna have? It's just so complex. And my, I feel differently. I feel like it's so complex that we must be careful about writing the low-level systems, otherwise there's no chance we're gonna understand the high-level systems. And I think as you get to greater levels of maturity, as companies, you know, like a lot of companies will start with ROS. I think, so ROS 2 is trying to make a much harder case, but a lot of times you can bring something up very quickly in ROS, but when you're trying to, to certify something or get to a higher level of maturity, then not being able to control message passing rates or other thing in, in detail becomes a, a limitation. And if you get to a higher level of maturity, having all your state declared, knowing you're gonna get exactly deterministic replays, that's a powerful feature that you just cannot get in ROS. So that's one thing, you know, in Gazebo, in ROS, it's not a, it's not a knock, it's just the, the nature of choosing that path is that you will probably never get the same simulation twice. Simulation should be repeatable, right? But if you put in the middle of it message passing, which is depending on operating system threads coming in and out at certain timing, right? It is very hard. You can, you can build wrappers around it to synchronize everything. It's a lot of work, but you can do that. But it, the fact is you, you can't run the same experiment twice, right? The simulation will be slightly different every time. So it makes it harder to debug, harder to certify. Um, if you declare extra state and everything like this, then you can. Okay, yeah, so the, <clears throat> the basic plan for the course is, uh, I'll finish up here. Let me take one second to start the robot booting again so I don't have to wait too long. How long does it take to start? It takes too long to start. I'll be able to walk home in 10 minutes. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so the basic plan for the course is to go through that ladder of complexity. This is why I didn't leave it on the whole time. We're gonna talk about perception systems, sometimes by themselves, but we'll try to break the, the, the distinction, okay? We'll have some lectures on Perception, for sure. We'll do both the sort of geometric perception, which can get you pretty far and are, gives you some of the core skills from, uh, from kinematics and geometry, okay, that are relevant. Geometric perception is sort of one way to think about it, and then deep learning based or data driven perception will certainly be a topic also, okay. We'll do kinematics and dynamics and motion planning, for instance. We'll definitely talk about some um, dynamics and control. Spoiler alert, touching, ro big robots touching small objects is pretty, you know, gets pretty complicated. Contact mechanics is tough. We'll spend a bit Di diving into the contact mechanics world, okay? And <clears throat> we'll do some higher level task planning. Okay, so, but I, my goal is not to just say like, the first quarter of the term is perception, the next quarter of the term is, is, is motion planning and so on. What I'm gonna try to do is build a manipulation system that can do a, a full stack task move all the objects in this bin over to this bin, even if you throw in random objects. That'll be one of the things we build up. Okay, and we'll build a basic competency of, in perception, planning, dynamics, and control to accomplish that task. And then we'll spiral out, okay? And we'll, divide, we'll try to introduce the new concepts to do more complicated things if it makes our robot capable of doing something new, okay? I'm gonna try to put in more mobile manipulation this time because I think it's awesome and I hope you do it on your project, okay? And then at the end, we'll have a, a handful of lectures that are more like the research topics, the boutique lectures we call them, where 
Now, and I'll query you guys throughout the term about what you're interested in, but if we want to dive in and talk about what does it look like to think about belief-based planning for manipulation? You know, what does it look like if we're going to think about tactile sensors in a really, uh, you know, for a lecture? Okay, and we'll have a handful of options that we can pick from to do the last lectures. While you're focused on your project and not listening to me so much, uh, we'll talk about the sort of more research threads. Cool? Okay, that's the plan for the course. I hope you keep coming. Thank you for sitting in the crowded room. We'll see you next time. Make sure you sign on to Piazza, please. How's it going? It's good. I was wondering if you have you heard of RT2? Any chance from Google? Of course, yeah. Do you think that's like sort of?